Um, so presenting from carried over from last month, we had a, a veterans recognition and, and uh, the way God works this is that he, he gives us a little clues to what's going to happen the, the next month. So I want to introduce you. I'll give you a short bio now. I told Rick that I wouldn't I wouldn't add the beer. But uh, Rick. While you're doing that, Randy, I'm going to get this thing going. So okay. Like, uh, Rick. Um, well, just, Rick is a history buff. You're going to find that out. He has a Bachelor of Science uh, from Western Illinois University and an MBA in Operations Management from the University of Illinois. Rick and his wife, Cindy, live in Castle Rock with their two children and two dogs. <coughs> the children are here. The dogs are at home. <laughs> Correct? Yeah. Uh, Cindy, I'm sorry. You're his wife. Yes. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> <The whole family. laughs> Rick comes from one of those great American families that go off to serve in the military for one stint and then return to civ civilian life. Uh, his grandfather crossed Europe with Patton's army. His father-in-law was in the Navy where he's was severely injured during a kamikaze attack at the Battle of Okinawa. His dad was in the Air Force welding on B-52s at Tansanut Air Base, Vietnam. His brother served in Operation Iraq Freedom. And in the same unit as Congressman Mike Kaufman. And Rick served as an artillery officer in the Marine Corps at the end of the Cold War. And his mom is one of the many great patriot moms that worried and prayed back at home as her men serve. Rick's gonna share something about Patton's Prayer. Yeah, thank you, Randy. All right, hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have too much energy and uh, be too happy for 7 a.m., but uh, that's how it goes. First, some introductions. Um, this is me with DirecTV, and this is me with cable. <laughs> for, uh, for those of you that weren't here last month, uh, I gave my background. My background is I was born short and bald and not much has changed. <laughs> Dang. I know. I'll be here all week. <laughs> all right. So, uh, we're going to talk about some fascinating history and some history that I'm afraid is too often overlooked. Um, we're going to be talking about Patton Prayer and the Battle of the Bulge. First, uh, you know, Bill O'Reilly came out with uh, Killing Patton, what, a couple years ago. Um, I like what he wrote at the beginning. I thought uh, this was something interesting to share. So the dichotomy of Patton. George S. Patton was a man of many contradictions. He was a dyslexic who became an accomplished poet. He was a cavalry officer and a traditionalist who was on the cutting edge of armored warfare technology. He was a devout Episcopalian who also had a keen belief in personal reincarnation. He was an Olympic athlete who was extremely accident prone. He had a squeaky falsetto speaking voice, but managed to give the most inspirational speeches ever given by a military commander. He was deeply religious and utterly profane. Pretty interesting character. So, um, you know, one of the problems as we look back at history, we can never fully divorce ourselves of the knowledge of the outcomes. We know how World War II ends. What I'm gonna ask is that we suspend kind of that knowledge for a moment. Because, because we know the outcomes, we often think, of course we won the revolution without realizing the risk and the cost. Or, of course we won World War II without realizing the, the jeopardy we were in in December of 44, uh, 71 years ago. So let's first uh, reacquaint ourselves with some history, uh, the, the timeline. So in September of 39, Hitler invades Poland. December of 41, Pearl Harbor Day, right? It's not until June 44 that D-Day occurs. I often forget that time period between Pearl Harbor and D-Day. Paris is liberated in August of 44. Battle of the Bulge happens in December. FDR dies April 12th of 45. Three weeks later, Hitler's, or Germany surrenders. 
right? Um, so it was a pretty, it was a, for, for me, it was a relatively quick from uh, D-Day to, to Germany surrendering. Um, there was a lot going on before <coughs> and during, um, but it's a pretty short time period. We land in June, and, and less than a year later, uh, Germany surrenders. So let's look at the pr prelude to uh, the Battle of the Bulge. So that's what we're talking about today, is the Battle of the Bulge. So the Germans had been retreating since D-Day, <clears throat> continually being pushed back. The Soviets are about to penetrate Eastern Germany. The, uh, the Allies are constantly bombing Germany. Uh, the Allies have outrun their supply lines. Their troops are fatigued. And there's infighting. And as we recall from history, the infighting is really between the Americans and the English, right? From our perspective, Montgomery was a handful. And I'm sure if, if we went to England right now, uh, England would say Eisenhower and Patton and Bradley were a handful. Uh, but there was infighting. The Allies were overconfident. Um, I like this, the, uh, the chaplain that, that we're going to talk about here soon, he says uh, the weather was immoderate. And we'll come back to that word when we look at the weather. Right, it was immoderate. And Patton is preparing to breach the West Wall, also known as the Siegfried Line. Um, and we'll see that on a map. So the German plan. So the plan is, German, Germany's in big trouble, he just indicated. Um, so, so Hitler has this plan. He's going to launch this surprise attack. Uh, the goal is to seize Antwerp, Belgium. Well, we're going to see that on a map here in a moment. Why Antwerp? Because pre preparing for D-Day, we bombed a lot of the railroads and roads so the Germans couldn't bring supplies in uh, to the west, right, uh, to, to uh, counter our attack. Well, once we successfully landed, those same railroads that would have been helpful to us were destroyed by us. Isn't that interesting? Um, so Antwerp was a was a port to the north, and, and it, was, it was a way we were able to capture it without destroying it. It was a way to bring in supplies uh, to the Allies as they were getting ready to penetrate Germany. So the, the the idea was if if Germany could could capture Antwerp, they would uh, they would get the Allies to sue for peace because. Uh, the plan included capturing four uh, Allied armies, which is like 400 to 600,000 men. Um, it would capture the port. It would make it difficult to bring in the supplies. Uh, if, if this plan was successful, they could get the Allies to sue for peace. They, it would buy them time to build their jet weapons, uh, their, their uh, jet planes, their, their missiles. Um, and they were even working on nukes. And then they could just focus on Russia. Uh, excuse me, at the time of the Soviet Union. An interesting uh, part of this operation of Battle of the Bulge is they had covert ops. So what they did is they, they recruited, uh, they identified people that understood America, maybe grew up in America, spoke with an American accent, gave them American uniforms, and let them infiltrate into the American lines. And the Americans found out about this, and everybody was jittery. So, so th these uh, German covert operators would change signs, you know, so uh, we turn the signs around, confuse the troops, uh, just kind of wreak mayhem. So the Americans knew about this, and they were very jittery. So they would, and we've seen this in different movies, they would challenge each other with who won the World Series, you know, who was a home run leader, and different things. Well, one day, Omar Bradley gets stopped at a checkpoint while everyone is jittery, and they ask him, what is the capital of Illinois? And he responds, Springfield. Unfortunately, the soldier thought the capital was Chicago. So poor Omar Bradley gives the right answer and almost got into you know, a pickle there. I love that story. That'd be my luck. My life hinges on some guy that thinks the capital of uh, uh, Illinois is Chicago. And if you don't know, it's Springfield. Um, yeah. All right, so let's get oriented. Um, D-Day happens here. Uh, the Americans are on the German border, the Allies. Antwerp is a circle. Belgium is kind of that top right corner of uh, Germany. 
you know, one of the things I find interesting is from the Normandy beaches to Berlin is only 844 miles. If we left here this morning and got in 76 up to uh, 70, up to 80, uh, between here and like the uh, western uh, border of Illinois, that's 844 miles. <laughs> Many of us have driven back east. It doesn't take very long to get back here. It's not a very long distance. We're going to be talking about the 101st Airborne and the 10th Armored Division. Uh, the 101st are going to jump into Normandy in June. The 10th Armored are going to come ashore at, at uh, Sherport, France, in September. So that just kind of orients us to uh, the, the geography. Taking a closer look, this here is a closer look. This is the German plan. So Antwerp is up there. Blue line is the American lines. The red line is the west wall. So the German's plan is to send five armies, five of the best armies, uh, SS groups, um, from Germany and seize, seize uh, Antwerp. And what they want to do is capture the Allied armies up here. So that's the plan. And, I, and I, I have to go through all this history to set the table. If we just got to the punchline, it, it wouldn't quite be there. Uh, meanwhile, with the Allies, the Allies believed that the wooded, mountainous terrain would be easily defended. Poor Omar Bradley, and he lived a long, long life. He, uh, he had to defend his, his plan uh, to not put many troops up in the Ardennes Forest there in Belgium, uh, where, where the Battle of the Bulge happens. He has to defend his, his, uh, his decisions for the rest of his life. Again, the Allies are very overconfident. Um, they, they had just beaten and beaten the Germans. There was no radio traffic. One of the things we, we now know, didn't necessarily realize at the time, was there was a lot of radio traffic, uh, you know, military uh, radio communication as we went through France, you know, that we intercepted. Um, we had the French resistance, which was giving us human intel. Once we pushed Germany back into Germany, they started using telephone and telegraph to communicate. So we weren't intercepting radio communications, and we mistook that for they're just hunkering down for the winter, getting ready, you know, defensive positions, getting ready for us to attack. Well, we're going to be surprised. Um, the Allies called the offensive uh, the Ardennes counteroffensive. The, the media actually coined the term Battle of the Bulge, because you'll see on a map, it looks like a bulge. I, I, I didn't know that for a number of years. I learned that a few years ago. When they say bulge, they're talking like a bulge. It's not like some European term or anything. Uh, it's like a bulge. So the battle begins December 16, 1944 at 5.30 a.m. 1,600 artillery pieces assault with a 90-minute barrage. The best German units attack on an 80-mile front. Um, <coughs> Americans are caught totally surprised. A couple things happened very early in the battle. Um, there was the Malmody mass Massacre, which is just north of uh, uh, Bastogne. So what happens is uh, the Germans overtake um, 150 men from the 7th Armored. They take them prisoners, march them back, you know, as, as prisoners of war, get them in a holding area, and then open up with machine gun fire uh, and kill most. Some flee. Um, then again, in Werith, 11 uh, black soldiers are captured, tortured, and killed. And word of this uh, spreads. Germany, they're, they're a caged animal at this point, right? Their uh, back is against the wall. They are all out. These are SS troops. So word, word travels that, that they're not playing this time. Uh, this, this is serious. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from that 80 mile front is we're going to focus in on a little town called Bastogne. Um, so on December 18th, uh, well actually let me, let me back up. So we're surprised, right? The 101st is in Paris. They're recovering. Uh, they're resting after uh, uh, some battles they had had earlier. We're surprised. Uh, anybody that's seen Battle of the, or uh, excuse me, uh, Band of Brothers? that series, uh, you'll recall it came on the loudspeakers in Paris. If you're in the 101st, get in here, get on trucks. 
Um, the 82nd Airborne was supposed to go farther north than the 101st, but the 101st were able to uh, grab trucks faster than the 82nd was, so they were on the road first. Um, typically, in, uh, in tactical movements, I was an artillery officer, and we uh, towed our howitzers uh, with, with trucks. So when we'd have tactical movements at, light, at night, we'd have these, uh, all, all the vehicles have these little lights, they have hoods, it's almost like a book light. Uh, for headlights. It just shines it right down. You can't see very far, so you go very slowly. Um, this is full lights on. So so the 101st, they're hauling lights on at night in a combat zone. 10th Armor is doing the same thing. The 10th Armor gets to, to Bastogne first, um, and they, uh, they're they able to secure the west side. Um, the 101st gets in the next day. By the 21st, the Americans there, 22,000, are completely surrounded. We're outnumbered at least two to one. <clears throat> some books say five to one, some say two to one. We're lacking ammo, cold weather gear, and medical supplies. There was a makeshift hospital that was built that was <coughs> we lost. We lost the medical staff, we lost the supplies. Um, it, it, was, it was some dark days. The thing I'll share is the reason we focus on Bastogne, the reason we kind of uh, go from the macro to the micro, is because the media was resting in Bastogne because it was a nice little town in the nice Ardennes forest. Um, they were the embedded media before embedded media. <laughs> so the, the reason we know so much, in fact some of the more fierce fighting was up north, but we know so much about Bastogne because the media was there. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, on this slide, you'll see, uh, again, Antwerp's at the top, Bastogne is at the bottom. It's kind of on the Belgium-Luxembourg uh, border. We're all very familiar with Luxembourg, right? Not so much. <laughs> Me neither. Uh, weather. The weather was brutal. Uh, the high during, during this period, so, so Bastogne happens from the 16th to the 26th. The high is 19, the low is is negative 13. And these are highs for the day. 19 to negative 13. And the fog. So um, I was able to find something online. It was a fascinating report. It gave the weather for each day. It was, a, it was an army uh, uh, document. So visibility was less than 100 yards on December 19th, 20th, and 21st. Visibility less than uh, 100 yards. On the 22nd, it got real crazy. It got from 500 to 1,000 yards. So desperately cold, can't see. Um, and I thought, to help make this point, I did Operation Cold Weather in 87. That's me on the right uh, at the top. I've had friends say that looks like an 80s uh, boys band album cover. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, so you look at, at the cold weather gear, you know, we had boots that were rated to negative 30. Um, and, and this is in Norway, north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, but the temperatures were about the same. Um, heavy coats, wool shirts, wool pants, uh, you know, the long johns. We had liners for our mittens, several several sets that we could change. Uh, the guys at the Battle of the Bulls, they basically had what they came ashore with. And they didn't carry packs like we carry packs now. Um, right? When you see the old movies, they're not carrying packs. They don't have anything on them. Uh, if they were lucky, they had like galoshes, you know, those like rubber boots to put over their combat boots to stay dry. But we just saw the weather. High 19, the lowest during that period, negative 13. Look at how these guys are dressed. Think about sitting at a football game, three hours, right? You know, when it's like 25, 20 degrees, you know, you just freeze. And you know when it's gonna end. These guys in the battle didn't know it was gonna end on the 26th. So they're just, they're in, they're in holes, right? Just trying to live, they can't see, they're freezing, there's no food, there's no ammo. The art, artillery got down to a total of 400 rounds, uh, 400 available shells that they could shoot. Because they couldn't get, the whole issue was with that fog that we talked about, they couldn't be resupplied. The roads are icy, they can't get the trucks in, they can't get resupplied. They can't bomb the Germans. We're outnumbered significantly. Bad news. 
Private Bart Hagerman uh, has a very famous quote. You'll see it in a lot of the Battle of the Bulge things. He says, both the enemy and the weather could kill you. And the two of them together was a pretty deadly combination. So this takes us to the 22nd, right? So it starts at 16, we get to the 22nd. The, uh, we're doing our time. Um, American lines, all of a sudden a German contingent comes with a big white flag. Uh, the Americans bring them in and, and the Germans present a surrender uh, ultimatum. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll shorten it, and I'll, I'll read part of it. Here's the highlights. To the USA commander of the encircled town of Bastogne, the fortune of war is changing. This time the USA forces in and near Bastogne have been encircled by strong German armored units. There is only one possibility to save the encircled USA troops from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of the encircled town. In order to think it over, uh, in order to think it over, a term of two hours will be granted beginning with the presentation of this note. Very generous, you got two hours. All the serious civilian losses caused by the artillery fire would not correspond with the well-known American humanity Signed the German commander. So the note makes it uh, through the lines back to uh, the general, which, oh, by the way, <coughs> the commanding general of the 101st isn't there. He went back to the United States for a, uh, like a staff command meeting because, again, we didn't expect anything to happen. So the commanding general isn't there. So the division artillery commander is, is in charge of the 101st. Could this story get any worse? Right? You kind of see a pattern here. So, so his name is uh, General McCullough. So the note makes it back to General McCullough, who's napping. He's been up for days. Uh, so they wake him up. General uh, Germans presented a, a, a surrender. So his first thought is the Germans wanted to surrender. He said, good. And they're like, uh, no, sir. They want us to surrender. So he reads it. And he wasn't, uh, was not a profane man. Uh, history records that this was kind of the, the, uh, the most uh, almost like swearing that he would do. He reads it and his response is, ah, nuts. Uh, so he gathers up his staff and he says, all right, gang, how, how are we going to uh, respond to this? And uh, they, they, there's some, some uh, chatter about it, what, what the response should be. And you know, they're, they're coming up with some eloquent things. And Lieutenant Colonel Harry Kennard says, he was the one that woke up the general. He, he says, Sir, I think the first thing you said is, is the most appropriate. And the general said, what did I say? And he said, you said nuts. So the group, uh, and we're going to talk about Kennard later on. Uh, so keep that, that name in mind. So surrounded, cold, no <laughs> supplies, um, outnumbered, right? So what do the Americans do? Do the German commander. Nuts, the American commander. <laughs> they present the, the note back to the German contingent, and they don't understand, you know, what nut, you know, they know that nuts means like peanuts. They say, what does this mean? And the Americans say it means go to hell. <laughs> so game on, right? Is that a cool American story? <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, uh, Patton's on the east eastern front of France, itching to get into uh, get into Germany. Um, he's waiting for supplies. The weather isn't cooperating. So he summons Chaplain James O'Neill on December 8th. Um, and it's a pretty fascinating story. I'm, I'm going to read some. Forgive me. Um, but O'Neill uh, records. He gets a call at 11 a.m. This is General Patton. Do you have a good prayer for the weather? We must do something about the rain if we are to win the war. So O'Neill goes back and he looks at all the prayer books. And there's no, too bad there and just walked up. There are no good weather prayers in the prayer book. So O'Neill writes one and he takes it back to Patton. Uh, Patton looks at it and says, great, uh, let's do that. And O'Neill says, you know, being Christmas time might be nice if you came up with a Christmas message. So. Uh, Patton said, said, fine, and, and O'Neill wrote that. And I'll pass some examples of the prayer cards around. Um, so 
patent says, yep, yeah, I like it, perfect. Make 250,000 copies and give it to every man in the third army and command them to pray. <laughs> Is that different than today? Um, Whoa. <laughs> today, if, if military people are too, too uh, religious, they get in trouble, right? But, but Patton, um, he not only had the prayer uh, printed in a war zone, it was actually the group that, that made the maps, uh, was it, topographical uh, unit. Uh, they're the ones that made up the cards. So again, I'd like to do some, some reading and share kind of the how uh, history records this. The often profane and tempestuous general and the humble, mild-mannered priest then engaged in a lengthy, lengthy discussion of the importance of prayer. Chaplain, how much praying is being done in the Third Army, inquired general, uh, the general. By everybody? Uh, asked asked O'Neill. Yes, by everybody. I'm afraid to admit it, but I do not believe that much praying is going on, responded O'Neill. Chaplain, I am a strong believer in prayer, said Patton. There are three ways that men get what they want. By planning, by working, and by praying. Any great military operation takes careful planning or thinking. Then you must have well-trained troops to carry it out. That's working. But between the plan and the operation, there is always an unknown. That unknown spells defeat or victory, success or failure. It is the reaction of the actors to the ordeal when it actually comes. Some people call that getting the breaks. I call it God. God has his part or margin in everything. That's where prayer comes in. That was General Patton. We learned that in high school history, didn't we? <laughs> Not so much. Um, you'll see the prayer cards coming around. Uh, I'll read uh, what was written in the prayer. On the one side of the prayer it reads, Almighty and most merciful Father, we beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate reigns with which we have contended. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us soldiers who call upon thee that, armed with thy power, we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. And on the uh, flip side of the card it says, to each officer and soldier in the 3rd United States Army, I wish you Merry Christmas. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We march in our might to complete victory. May God's blessings rest upon each of you on this Christmas day. G.S. Patton, Jr., Lieutenant General Commanding, 3rd United States Army. So the results. We know we we're in a pickle. We know the 3rd Army uh, prayed. Patton's adjutant, Paul Harkins, uh, would later write, whether it was the help of divine guidance asked for in prayer or just the normal course of human events, we'll never know. At any rate, on the 23rd, the day after the prayer was issued, the weather cleared and remained perfect for about six days, enough to allow the Allies to break the back <coughs> of the von Rumsfeld Offensive and turn a temporary setback into a crushing defeat for the enemy. Praise God, huh? Um, on the 23rd, 241 cargo planes are going to drop supplies on Bastille. Just that fast. Isn't that amazing? Um, Patton writes of it in his autobiography. I mean, this, you know, it's, we could say it was happenstance, right? Just a simple 250,000 prayer cards were printed. Um, German and American meteorologists did not expect the weather to break. In fact, Germany planned the offensive around this weather. This was one of the four keys to the success of their offensive. Um, the prayer happens, the weather clears, and the planes come in. By the time it's over at Bastogne, you'll see this, uh, I'll point to it, the color isn't showing up real well. This is, this orange line is the German advance. That's why they call it the bulge. That's how far the Germans had advanced. Postscript. General Patton. In his journal on Christmas Eve, 1944, he writes, A clear, cold Christmas, lovely weather for killing Germans. 
General McAuliffe. He will spend the rest of his life answering questions and jokes about the nuts comment. He'll tell the story that uh, he had a lovely dinner at an old southern lady's home. Um, he was very happy that the nuts uh, incident didn't come up. As he's leaving, he's thanking uh, the, the nice host for a lovely evening. And uh, she said, you're welcome, General McNutt. You could never outrun the nut story. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Harry Kennard. Uh, remember, he was the one that said, sir, I think you ought to use the nuts comment. He'll go on to uh, Vietnam fame, write a book called We Were Soldiers. And Mel Gibson would play him in the movie about the book, We Were Soldiers. Not bad. He makes it in history uh, with, with the nuts story, and then he gets played by Mel Gibson. <laughs> Chaplain James O'Neill, he'll retire from the Army and continue his priestly ministry here at Pueblo, Colorado, at the Cathedral of the Sacred Heart. Isn't that fascinating? So the famous patent prayer is written by a, a priest that would, would retire and finish his ministry right here in Colorado. The 10th Armored Division, General McAuliffe would go on to say, it seems regrettable to me that the 10th Armored Division didn't get credit it deserved at the Battle of Bastogne. Actually, the 10th Armored Division was in there a day before the 101st and had some very hard fighting before we ever got into it. And I sincerely believe that we would never have been able to get into Bastogne had it not been for the 10th. There is a road northeast of Bastogne, uh, North 877, that is still named for the major uh, that, that defended that road back in December of 44. And this is a very personal story to me because my grandpa was one of those 22,000 sitting in that cold fighting hole. Wow. So I'm thankful, praise God, that, that uh, God delivered. It has impacted me wow. personally. <laughs> in conclusion, America, we've had God's hand on us and often we forget and it worse yet, we probably take it for granted. As Habakkuk says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. O Lord, re renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. We can't forget God's hand. And it wasn't just at the Battle of Bastogne. There could be books written about all the times God has delivered. Um, you know, one of the things I'm going to encourage is they sell these prayer cards on eBay. Um, they're, they've actually gone up. Uh, they, they were running about six bucks. I checked last night for about nine bucks. There's probably a lot of folks around the country doing the same thing. Demand is up, so the price is up. Punch a hole in it, uh, hang it on your Christmas tree. When your children and grandchildren ask, what does that mean? Just like Joshua did with the Hebrews, tell them. Let me tell you the story of how God delivered us. Further reading, if you're interested, uh, Douglas County Library has some good books. Um, this one is called No Greater Valor, The Siege of Bastogne and the Miracle that Sealed the Allied Victory. Uh, again, right here at the Chuck uh, Sky Library. This one is Patton, Blood, Guts, and Prayer. So, um, praise God for his deliverance. Um, Merry Christmas, everybody. I should enjoy it. Merry Christmas. Five seventy and eighty seven is proud to announce that we are now the broker for Rick McFadden and his family. Uh, so if anyone wants to book him next year. <laughs> Rick, thank you so much. You have a fascinating story and um, and actually very inspiring. Um, we live in we're blessed to live in an amazing country. And um, I'm I'm touched by the fact that this group has come out to hear about the power of prayer. Um, and, and, and in that mode, I'm going to just say a, a, a closing prayer that Lord of, of hosts, Lord of lords, um, pray that your blessing would be on this season, that uh, there are many hurting, there are many suffering. Pray for your healing. Pray for your care in that regard. Pray that you lift them up. Pray that those of us that might be just kind of sitting on the sideline, that we'd be, that we'd be awoken, that we'd become 
more engaged in your truth and that we take this opportunity, this season, this Christmas, this celebration to share with friends and neighbors. Lord, I pray that everyone here would have a special anointing as they step out, that they'd be encouraged to step into ministries like Jimmy Graham's or CR 85 and take a, an active togetherness uh, purpose of action. We, we would move as one. Um, we lift this up in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.